hey, good afternoon, happy Monday. Dr. Alan Christensen here with you for Office Hours Live. Uh, lots of folks jumping on already. Good to see you guys. Nice to see some friends coming in and joining. Uh, Barbara, we got Doctor here with us. <laughs> we got Kate, Clarita, many others. So Office Hours Live, uh, Monday, regular, regular thing. Yeah, here's where we hang out. And I'll cover a few things that I've been writing about as of late and grab some questions that come in. My favorite format is to get a few of the first couple of questions and go really deep with them. So if you got something top of mind, you know, a lot of things came in about fatigue. I did do a live Zoom Q&A last week about fatigue, and that was a big topic. There was tons of interest that came in about that. And I was just thinking, too, there was a lot of questions I didn't get to cover in that. So I've got those written out and listed still, too. And I'll grab some of those if need be. <laughs> but usually enough comes in to keep us going and keep us plenty busy for the next half hour, 40 minutes, however that plays out. Welcome back, Melody. Seeing a lot of old friends here with me today. Cindy's here and Angela. Yeah, and I'm with you guys on Instagram Live and also on Facebook. Uh, boy, I don't know if you guys have seen this at home, but internet access is really tough these days. I think the whole world is online right now. And our systems are just not set up for that. So if I glitch or if I drop, I apologize, but that's why. And I'll be right back on real quick. But otherwise, <laughs> I will do my best. So questions coming in already too, totally cool. And yeah, I'm writing a big thing because of the fatigue discussion last week and all the things that came up about fatigue, I'm writing quite a bit about iron. I'm going to do a series of deep dive discussions about iron and thyroid disease, like more detail than I've ever come up before. Super jazzed about that. Excited to share this with you. Learned a lot of things already. <laughs> I've picked up some stuff I wasn't aware of before. Um, anyone on iron pills? I'll talk about a few nuances there. I learned one insight that was pretty shocking. If you've ever taken iron pills and they didn't work or bothered your stomach, there's a workaround that's completely counterintuitive with that. So I'm happy to tell you guys about that one. Uh, Carol's here. Carol had a question. Um, good ones coming in already. And yeah, especially if they're fatigue related, thyroid disease, fatigue from thyroid disease, I'll cover whatever I get. But there was so much about that that came up last week. I'd love to spend some more time on that topic if that's useful for anyone. You know, what, what makes someone tired? How do thyroid levels affect that? You know, and then what are the other conditions? So this is a big thing, but the majority of people with thyroid disease have some other secondary condition. And even if their thyroid is perfect, that thing won't go away and that thing will still affect them. So what could those, what could that condition or conditions be? And how might that be relevant to some of the symptoms? That's a huge topic that I'm happy to share more with you guys about too. So yeah, let me start diving into some of the questions that came in. There were some good ones already. Um, welcome, many are coming on here. <clears throat> And Angela had a detailed question here. I'll cover this one for starters on Facebook. How do I shrink one of thyroid area larger than others? Uh, Hashimoto's and 137 synthroid hypo. One side looks bigger than other side. Feel great. Hmm. <laughs> well, honestly, one side looks bigger. So Angela, if you're talking about cosmetic visible difference, that's one thing. If you've had an ultrasound, there's a known enlargement. There are some nodules. There are some calcifications. There's a goiter that's forming. That's a different thing. So again, I love to go deep and have a good conversation with you. So anyone who's come on and asked some early questions, this is how we play it. I like to really get next levels and have it be really useful. So Angela, if you want to mention, is this something that you see or you notice? Or was this a finding that a doctor had on ultrasound? There were concerns reported to you about that. Those are a little different, but give me some more feedback and we'll keep the conversation going. So welcome, I'm on Instagram here too. Lots of folks jumping on. If you guys have any specific questions, the main theme is gonna be fatigue and thyroid disease and how those things relate, and how you can go ahead and improving one if you've got the other. So I'll keep an eye out for those too, but I got a bunch coming in here on Facebook. So uh, yeah, Carol asked if, the difference between plant and animal protein, is there a difference? Yeah, Carol, good question. There, there is, and a new paper came out just recently in the American, Clernal, Colonel, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. That's not a hard thing to say. I don't know why I was stumbling on that. But a new paper just came out looking at 
how they affect cholesterol specifically. And the biggest dietary driver of cholesterol is saturated fat. Um, not even like animal versus plant, but just saturated fat has more of an effect on cholesterol than any other dietary factor. Now, cholesterol, people are different. There's some that have a more dramatic effect from diet than others. And there are some people that have more of an effect from some parts of the diet than others. But nonetheless, uh, nonetheless, they were evaluating when people were on a higher or lower saturated fat diet, how the difference affected them in terms of animal protein versus vegetable protein. And in this study, they showed that animal protein did have some effects upon some cardiovascular markers, whereas the plant protein did not. And it was the most dramatic thing, again, was saturated fat, but they controlled for that. Now, in terms of the difference in efficacy, as far as general health, uh, the beneficial effects of protein, there are some dose differences. There are some ways in which animal proteins may be more efficient, but by and large, once you weigh out any dose differences, then not big, not big effects in terms of negatives, you know, no real negatives about plant protein. Now, one, one thought is that protein is relevant by itself, and then also protein is relevant in the context of your total food intake, your total caloric load. So if you're keeping the same amount of protein intake, you can maintain pretty well your lean body mass and your metabolism. But the pitfall is when you lower your food intake, your body still has the same protein needs. So if your food intake goes down and your protein goes down, you'll lose lean body mass. So even though you're going to lose weight, you might lose more lean body mass than you lose fat mass. And there have actually been papers showing that if you lower your protein intake dramatically, even if you're eating plenty of food, you can lose lean body mass while you grow fat mass. So this one study I looked at, they showed people that were on uh, about 7% protein diets, which is pretty low, and they were eating an extra 1,000 calories per day. So it was a very low protein diet, but they were being overfed. So they were gaining weight because they were being overfed, but as they gained weight, they lost muscle tissue. So what happened was they gained like 11 pounds on the scale, but when they did body composition, they gained 13 pounds of fat mass. So they were losing muscle as they were gaining weight. So yeah, so your protein intake is one of the biggest factors of your muscle mass and your basal metabolic rate. Um, and when your food intake gets lower, that's even more critical. So whenever you're trying to manage your weight to maintain it or to drop it, then you really need the protein. Now, in those cases, you're not gonna get protein deficient. None of this is about protein deficiency because that's something that doesn't really happen unless you starve. So as long as you're not starving, you won't get protein deficient. So yeah, off the table but your body composition will suffer unless you're getting a good amount. And that's somewhere around a gram per pound of lean body weight per day. Some will say per pound of weight, somewhere between that though. So if a woman is 140 pounds, she's 25% body fat for easy math. So that's about 35 pounds of body fat. So she's got about hundred pounds of lean body mass. So if she gets about hundred grams of protein, she can maintain that pretty well. But the further she goes below that, the more she taps into her muscle tissue. Now, plant versus animal protein, not big differences for efficacy. However, in terms of practicalities, it is harder if you're only getting plant protein not to go way above your food target. Many of the plant protein sources, they are, they're great sources, but they're giving you a lot of calorie per protein. You know, So like beans, most types of beans and peas are about five parts of carbohydrate to one part of protein. Nuts and seeds, good foods, but they're about five parts of fat to one part of protein. Whereas most animal proteins that are lean are not much more than protein as far as what they're contributing. So that's the main advantage they have. But as far as not getting deficient, yeah, you can do fine either way. And in terms of getting enough, you definitely can do it on plant only sources, but you gotta be more strategic about that. And you do get fewer food choices. So we think then about what's the harm from there being a mix. You know, is, do you have to be free of all animal proteins to have some health benefits. No, you know, all the studies looking at longevity at disease risk in populations, we see that people that are omnivores have, whenever you rule out things like their exercise, their smoking status, their body size, healthy omnivores are healthy. <laughs> so if the goal is to be healthy, you can do that having some animal protein and plant protein is wonderful. They're both good and they can both work well for you. Okay. So lots more folks have came on since I started that little 
little tirade about protein. It's a topic that's important. You know, I, I played around with diet so much when I was younger, before I was in medical school. And that's what got me going into this, was just knowing what a big deal diet was and how much it affected health. And I've tried so many diets early in life. And, you know, I guess I've not experimented as much in the last probably decade, but I, I wrecked my health by being too stringent on various diets. I, I've been raw food vegan for lengths of time, and I resonate with the ethical arguments. I resonate with the humanitarian arguments, but some people just don't do well unless they're consuming a certain amount of protein, you know, and animal protein as well. So there's, there's that. And I've looked hard at, you know, what does the data say about your long-term health? Because if the data was strongly saying that you had to give up animal protein to be healthy, I would make it work. You know, I would go out of my way to find ways just to take whatever compromise I had to take, but do that towards longevity. I would do that in a heartbeat. And I would tell my family to do the same thing. But that data has not really existed. It's just not, it's just not there. Okay, so let me grab a couple of comments here from Instagram land. I saw a few comments and questions that came in. Uh, one comment. This was here, just read your book, and today is first day of ARD. That's awesome. Hope you enjoyed that. You know, that was a apropos stuff. A lot of folks have stress levels that are higher these days. The adrenal thing, it's, it's real. You know, the HPA function is very significant. So I'm really proud of that book and the program in that. We've seen so many people just completely transform their health, their lives, their HPA axis. So awesome and kudos to you and hope it works out well. And take a peek at that thriving chapter at the end and I'd love for you to be there in the course of just a few months and to be following the guidelines in that thriving chapter. But that does happen well for people. Another one here, I would love to hear about ways to prevent postpartum thyroid issues. Yeah, yeah, good, good question. So if you would like to delineate, um, is, is, PAC, is, is PASIC? <laughs> if you would like to delineate, whether you have any thyroid issues already or you wish to avoid them, that's a little different if you have them and you don't want them to worsen or you're just susceptible, you don't want them to start. So different things. If you wanted to find that, I'll watch and give a better answer. The general answer for preventing thyroid disease if you don't have it is to really, the, the two biggest things, the two most important things are dialing in two minerals and it's your iodine and your selenium. There are countless other steps we could talk about, but their relative contribution is minuscule compared to those two steps. So yeah, if you can do nothing else but those two things, you will go a long ways towards preventing thyroid disease. The things that trigger it that we can't control are age and gender, you know, the older we get, and if you're female, those are two risks. And then genetics, there's not so much a smoking gun, but there's a lot of genes that contribute to risk, but again, can't change those. We can change their expression. And in changing their expression and changing the main nutritional drivers, that's iodine and selenium. They're the biggest things by far. Now, selenium, the trick is to, by and large, the main thing is not to get too little. You can get too much. It's not as common of a problem. It can happen through supplementation. So I don't encourage exceeding 200 micrograms of iodine through supplementation. Uh, it can be excessive. And I also wouldn't encourage going below 100 micrograms of iodine. I'm sorry, whoa, whoa, whoa selenium. <laughs> I'm not sure if I said selenium for the last one. So yeah, don't, don't go above 200 for selenium. Don't go below 100 for selenium for supplementation. Uh, and then dietary selenium. You know, the food sources of it, the one that's dense is Brazil nuts. And the cool thing is there are, they contain a version called selenocysteine, which basically you're not going to overdose on. I mean, even if you get too much, your body can pretty harmlessly excrete the excess of selenocysteine. That's not true for all chemical forms of selenium. The type that you'll often find in multis or selenium supplements are versions that you cannot excrete that readily, that your body may be stuck with and it can be toxic. But the kind in Brazil nuts and foods, you're not gonna get too much of. So just don't take too much in the pills. Get enough, take some in pills and get some from your diet. Currently I'm saying do two to four Brazil nuts per day and then a big host of other selenium rich foods, intact whole grains, beans, legumes, animal proteins, lots of things, and you'll do well on that. Iodine, that's dicier, and that's the whole fo to focus of the next book. There is going to be a docu-series coming out 
we're looking at June, hoping we're not to, <laughs> we're, we're at a better place, but yeah, we're looking at June to release a docu-series that we're just finalizing now, talking about invisible iodine and all these hidden sources of it that you weren't aware of. The upshot of it is that it's easy to get too much. You know, we need some and too little is bad, but too little is not a real risk for most people anymore. As recently as the 90s, we had 112 countries in the world that were at some level of iodine deficiency. And it was a big deal, it was catastrophic. Uh, the World Health Organization, the Iodine Disorders, uh, IGN Network, I think. Um, but there's some large global collaborative efforts to just wipe it out because it doesn't have to be going on anymore. And they succeeded. So between 1990 and 2014, the number of countries that were deficient went to zero. So, but now we've got over 50 countries that are at states of iodine excess. So more to come about that. Um, let me look back here, bunch, bunch more comments on both platforms. Nice to see you guys. Uh, let's see, hmm. oops, didn't mean to reverse it. I'm just scrolling and looking at questions. I'm gonna get one more here and then I'll go back to Facebook for a little bit. How difficult is it to heal from crashed phase in adrenal fatigue? Feeling a bit down and it's hard to stay positive about healing. Hey, awesome question. And I'm glad you asked that. So uh, adrenal fatigue. So please take a peek at some of my copy that I've written about adrenal fatigue. Just Google Alan Christensen and adrenal fatigue. And what you'll find out is that it's a bit of a misnomer and it's a misnomer in a way that could make someone feel more hopeless. You know, they make it sound like your adrenals are broken, like they're wiped out, like they can't work. And it's not true. That's not really what's happening. It's more of a matter of a dysregulation, but it's intentional. So the cut to the chase, often two, three months, it doesn't take that long. And that's not just to get better, that's to get like totally better. <laughs> so someone else was talking about starting the ARD. I don't think that was you from the same, it wasn't the same username. But, but no, that can turn around really quickly. Don't think you're stuck with that by any means. The adrenal reset diet does talk you through that pretty well, but your body can heal, your body can recover. It's not, your adrenals aren't broken. It's not that you've got a mild version of Addison's disease. Your whole body has got the parking brakes on, on purpose. It's not that you can't make cortisol, it's that you're choosing not to right now. And your body's doing that for a reason. The more you can support it and let it rest and recover, the quicker it can heal, but it can heal pretty quick. Okay, so one more here because it grabbed my eye. Both my November and April labs showed low iodine in the 30s. So Coco Lady, so Coco Lady, if you want to mention what your labs were, what happens is in almost all cases, people have urinary iodine levels checked. And the drawback is that urinary iodine is, a, is an accurate gauge of iodine for a population. For 500 people or more, it's not an accurate gauge for individuals. Now, there are ways people can take urinary iodine and run some math using creatinine to calibrate it, but that's pretty much never done. And for example, if someone is lower protein, we had a, one of my doctors just had a case recently of someone just like you who had a lab report saying iodine L for low, but there was no creatinine calibration as one has to do. So we did find her creatinine scores, we did calibrate it, she was on the high side of normal once that was done. So without a creatinine calibration, it's not meaningful to see that you're low in that. And once it is calibrated, few people are low. It just doesn't happen very much, hardly ever when they're accurately tested. So yeah, more to come on that in the near term. Okay, grab a few more on the Facebook side. Uh, I did mention iron at the beginning. Janet's saying, I get where I have been cold, warm up and mad, end up itchy. Yes, I am on iron tablets, huh? Yeah, so the thing is, is that many can have some side effects from iron tablets, and that's the, that's the drawback. Iron's tricky stuff to absorb. I'm just seeing if Janet has any follow-up comments to clarify that. Uh, had right lobe removed and had a thyroid adenoma, eyelids puffy, okay. Um, Ramon is with us here, Linda's here with us. Good to see you, Linda. Cheryl's here too. Lots more folks on. Let me grab a few more of these comments. Oh, here's one. I've seen natural selenium capsules from mustard. What do you think of this? Sometimes I crave mustard. Ramona, that's fascinating. I've never heard of that at all. Uh, I'm guessing you wouldn't get a lot just because the amount of mustard you would ingest is not high. 
but yeah, I don't know why you need to take it from that for the capsules. Um, yeah, that's curious. Brazil nuts are just really great foods. Someone says, Carol says, I seem to be aggravated by selenium and Brazil nuts and supplements. Yeah, Carol, if you want to talk about how you're aggravated, I'd be curious. So one, there was one really large study done about Brazil nuts and how they affected glutathione status. Uh, someone just asked about that, Denise did. So the study looked at how it affected glutathione status, how it affected growth and development markers in a large group of preschool children. And, you know, Brazil nuts, the study was done in Brazil. And the amounts they gave these kids, honestly, I they shouldn't have done it. You know, I mean, now we know they were fine, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known for sure they were going to be fine as much as they were consuming. I mean, these kids, I did the math, and if they were adults, they would have been consuming about like 50, 60 Brazil nuts per day. I mean, it was a quarter of their diet. It was massive amounts. And the number of micrograms of selenium they got was huge. It was just amazing how much they got. So what happened, though, is that they compared these kids against a similar group of kids who just everything was about the same, but they weren't given these Brazil nuts. They ate the same amount of food, and they had some more nuts in the diet, but no Brazil nuts. And the kids given the Brazil nuts, they looked at selenium in different ways. So you can measure selenium in the blood, in the hair, and in the nails, and also in the urine. And by and large, the blood markers show how much your body is using and you know, how much you have. The other markers mostly show how much you're eliminating, how well you're getting rid of selenium. And the kids that were like living on Brazil nuts, they were, they were peeing out selenium like nobody's business. It was coming out their nails, their hair. There was massive amounts in all their markers of selenium elimination. But what happened was the, uh, the markers of selenium status were perfectly healthy. So their body used enough, but it didn't get overloaded. And they were healthier than the kids that weren't getting it. And they had better glutathione metabolism and they had better health and development in a lot of other general ways. So, so yeah, it's in terms of getting selenium toxic, thankfully that's not likely to occur on Brazil nuts. Another follow-up comment, Coco Lady, as far as labs, I think it was 34.7 for my iodine right now, above 30, below 35 before that. Yeah, Coco Lady. So I, I'm due to... I'm going to update this pretty soon. In fact, I'll put that on my to-do list here too, is uh, iodine testing. I have written on this in the past, but there's been some newer data about the creatinine tests. So now there are ways you can accurately gauge your, I should back up. It doesn't say exactly how much iodine you're getting, but you can say if someone's getting too much or too little, or if they're reasonable. You can partition people based upon urinary iodine with creatinine ratio. Without the creatinine calculation, it's just completely meaningless because any one person, their iodine is going to be all over the place over the course of a few days. And 24-hour tests don't even help that. They don't even make it better really at all. You'd have to test your urine, no exaggeration, a little over 300 times and then average all those results to be within 90% of accuracy. So that's, that's the drawback. Three samples don't tell much of anything, unfortunately. Okay. So let me grab a couple more good questions here from Facebook. And so I'll, go, I'll come back. I saw some people ask about iron and comment on iron. Betsy asked if lactoferrin was a better alternative to iron. Yeah, Betsy, I did look at that one. And it has some small effects. It's so, so better. So iron and iron supplements, dietary iron. Um, I'll back up just a little. So right now as adults, your body is carrying somewhere between about like three to six uh, thousand milligrams or three to six grams. I'm looking around for something. Um, here's a, here's a toothpicker. It's, it's clean, but that's, that's about a gram. That's maybe a gram. So some of the mass of about four or five, six of those is what we're carrying in our bodies for iron. Most of that's in our red blood cells. And we're going to lose around a milligram per day if you're a menstruating woman, you might be losing a couple milligrams per day on average. You'll lose about 30 milligrams over the course of your menstrual cycle. So if you spread that out over the month, that's where I can say you can average about two milligrams a day because you're losing about a milligram a day just from old blood cells. So you're always losing one to two milligrams per day. And in your diet, we've got heme iron, which is from animal foods, non-heme iron, which is from both animal foods and from plant foods. And of those types, we can absorb um, a little more from heme than non-heme, probably about like 15 to 40%. 
heme iron, probably about like two to 20% for the non heme iron. And so we're getting a little fraction of what we're getting in and we're consuming somewhere like 10 to 20 milligrams per day on average. So you run all that math and basically menstruating women are just breaking even. They could very easily fall behind. If you're not consuming rich dietary sources and you're menstruating, you're probably gonna fall behind. And then we think about how much of a deficit you have. So if your stores are about four, five, 6,000 milligrams, we see that with someone who's got an overt iron deficiency anemia, they've probably got about 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams that they're missing out on. Uh, quick thing here, Cheryl just said no sound. Cheryl, I'm on Facebook with you. I've not heard that from anyone else on Facebook. Uh, Facebook, anyone give me a sound check, please? I'll watch for that. I've not changed any sound settings. So let me know if you can hear any sound, yes or no on Facebook, please. Um, back to the back to the discussion about iron. So yeah, so you're, you're looking at about a deficit of 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams if you've got an iron deficiency anemia. Short of that, we think about uh, latent iron deficiency. That's where you're not anemic. There's not a loss of blood cells, but there's probably a deficit in circulating iron in the form of ferritin. And that can still be 750 to 1,500 milligrams of iron that you're missing, that your body has lost from your stores. So you think that through, if you're getting just that little bit, if the budget is like losing a milligram and gaining a milligram each day from your diet, to have your diet make up for that, I did the math, if you could, if you could max out your diet, you might get an extra half a milligram per day coming into your system. And if you're behind, if you're behind by a thousand milligrams in your total pool, that's 2,000 days, you know? So that's what? That's like six, seven years to get that built up again. I'm seeing some feedback. It looks like my sound is coming through on Facebook. So thank you so much, Crystal, Alice, and Shelly. Um, yeah, Cheryl, you might want to double check your audio settings, which audio outputs you have on your Facebook with the speakers coming out. But, but yeah, so dietary is terribly slow. Supplements can be a bit better, but that's the benefit of IV iron for those who need it. You can build that store up right away. Now, the question that I was answering was about uh, uh, lactoferrin. And, and yes, it may have some bioavailable iron and it may affect absorption of iron, but it's not a particularly dense source. So not, not a big needle mover. The one thing I came across, there's a huge post I can't wait to share with you guys, it's like 10,000 words long, all, all things iron. I'll make some algorithms. You can easily see where you fit in these continuums, how much of a deficit you might have and how you could build it up again, what makes you low in it. But uh, if the one thing that's fascinating that I just read, they've done some papers and it turns out that there are some, some Hesperin, some Hesperin carriers that bring iron into your system and they stay saturated with iron for a matter of 24 hours or more. And the upshot of that is if you're taking iron supplements and you're doing that multiple times per day, you're, you're mostly just overloading a system that's already overloaded. So it turns out that taking iron on alternating days, once you look at someone six weeks out, they'll get the exact same amount of iron in their system by taking it alternating days as they would by taking a higher amount twice a day. Uh, but there are much fewer side effects. So if you have struggled with iron for side effects, it looks like you could do every other day and do just as well. This is a pretty brand new finding. There were some preliminary studies in 2017, but a larger one finalizing that, or not finalizing, but making it more concrete just came out in the last month or so. So I'll be writing about that, but that could be one, one new strategy if you struggled with taking iron is to do it every other day. It can actually work just as well and be a lot easier on your intestinal tract. So yeah, <laughs> let me take a peek at a few more questions that might be follow-ups to other questions or other comments that I've addressed here recently. I just saw a big one come on Instagram. I'll come back to that one. Uh, let's see, where am I at with Facebook? Let me grab a couple. Cheryl, uh, menopausal, thriving in adrenal fatigue, cancer, excessive urination, day and night. What else should I check for? Cheryl, so if you're doing well in your adrenal health, but you've got excessive urination day and night, you know, first and foremost, we think about there being any bladder infections. There are some endocrine issues that affect your body's electrolyte balance. Uh, excessive urination, if it's always high volume, then really it does come down to hydration. You know, if there's just too much coming in more than you need, 
Some can be lower in electrolytes that can be relevant. There are times where blood sugar can be a factor. If blood sugar is extremely off, it can be relevant. But yeah, some good things to screen for a simple urine test, a simple blood count chemistry panel. A doctor should give you some good sense out of that. Not, not too unusual. Marco, can joint pain be caused by oxalate sensitivity or buildup of oxalates in tissues over time, even if oxalate blood values are normal? Marco, yeah, good question. There are a lot of things you can find written that will talk about just that and talk about the dangers of that. The short version, the answer to that is quite clearly no. Um, I'm going to find a link here for you. Uh, here's one, Marco, that I did that was a pretty deep discussion on that topic. And let me put this up to share this with the group on Facebook with everyone. Here was a deep dive I did on oxalates. Yeah. And I talked about how even in those that have genetic defects of oxalate metabolism, no, oxalates don't build up in the tissues and cause pain. So please don't, don't stress about that one. We're often to read the post, check out the references. I also did a podcast episode with Sarah Ballantyne. We talked about this exact topic as well. She's written on this topic, but no, that wouldn't be an, a negative issue for you. Oh, here's a great one. Here's some crystal. I've completed four metabolism resets in the last year. I still wish to release three to 4% body fat. The recent BIA test and integrative doctor showed my BMR at 1,700 kilocalories, uh, daily energy expenditure of 2,700 calories. So, Crystal, you're pretty sharp for putting in the KCL because, yeah, technically calories are kilocalories, but we often just say calories to make it simple. Oh, and all the stuff you're doing, lean body mass, I want a deficit to get to my goal, too low, chronic size program, consuming too low. Hey, Crystal, yeah, so... The short version is it sounds like you're trying to work out the math by which you can exercise and eat and lose weight. Um, I'm, I'm glad you did the challenges. I'm not sure if you read the Metabolism Reset Diet book. If not, you might check that out. The basic idea is I talked in a lot of, lot of evidence why I don't like, I don't think it's effective to live at an energy deficit for long periods of time. I just don't think it's an effective strategy for people. And I don't think it's effective to exercise your way to weight loss. I think you're much better off finding a regime that can keep you steady when you're between a reset or between a challenge. But otherwise, don't expect that a healthy lifestyle will make you lose weight because the odds are stacked against that. Our bodies don't want to lose weight. It does take a rather unusual circumstance to cause us to do so. And I would argue that it's more effective when you're not training hard to lose weight. So I think you're doing some awesome things that are great for maintaining that. Uh, some people do well with calorie tracking. Honestly, I think that if you are getting a good mixture of protein, lots of fiber, plenty of, carb of, of good veggies, you know, maintaining activity, you should be able to stay steady without having to track as closely. Now, you wouldn't lose weight necessarily. That's what the resets are for. I would really suggest just taking a little bit of time and getting a good stabilizing regime, you know, watching your protein intake, getting to where you're at a healthy amount for your lean body mass. So for you, yeah, get your 125 grams of protein per day, spread that out throughout the day. But I would definitely not recommend to suggest consuming 1500 calories. Uh, or your, the current exercise program I'm on suggests consuming 1500 calories according to my weight. That seems low. Yeah, for sure, but going above makes me think I'll gain. Yeah, I would definitely not recommend trying to live on 1,500 calories for you. No, if your resting metabolic rate is 1,700 and you're probably burning some from your exercise, yeah. But even then, I wouldn't use those strategies in general. You know, do keep up with your exercise, get your protein, do lots of good stuff like that, but don't expect your day-to-day -day life to make you lose weight. It just doesn't do that, and if it does, you're losing weight in a way where you're probably going to bounce back up again. So look at the maintenance chapter of the book. Think about the maintenance ideas. You've got some, you're, you're educated. You've got some good help, it looks like. But I just wouldn't try to live in the weight loss mode. So hopefully that's useful and makes some sense. Let's see. <laughs> okay, so sound is back up. So Ramona, yeah, Ramona, thank you for asking about vitamin D. I did write about vitamin D pretty recently, did a deep dive on that. And you're talking about higher than 50. Now, vitamin D always got to clarify and talk about which units we're discussing, because I figured out there's endless confusion. 
And I think a lot of the confusion about vitamin D has become because a lot of health experts read research studies, which use one set of units. And then they talk about common blood tests, which use a different set of units. So most research studies talk about um, nanomoles per liter. And then most blood tests talk about uh, milligrams per mil, nanograms per mil. Yeah, they're different units. So it's a 2.5 factor difference. So the numbers are higher in the blood studies than in the lab studies than they are in the blood tests, right? So they're just different units. So the paper that I just wrote last Tuesday that I released about vitamin D, I was arguing the, the best current evidence saying that you want somewhere like 30 to 50 nanograms per mil on your blood test. And taking chemo, no, that doesn't change vitamin D requirements. That doesn't mean you would need more of it. And this is the thing, we see this more and more to where we think that if a nutrient does something and we need that to work better, we need more of the nutrient, but it's not how that works in the body. You know, if the body has nutrients are necessary, but they're not sufficient. So your keys are necessary for your car to move, but they're not sufficient for your car to move faster, right? So more keys don't make your car move faster. Hey, Classically Fab is back. Good to see you, Classically Fab. Last time you came on so late, I was finishing and I missed you. <laughs> so good to see you back. Yeah, so nutrients are necessary, but they're not sufficient. They're not the more the merrier. So I wouldn't change that based upon your, your chemo. Now, having said that, I'm not an oncologist. And if the chemo is interfering with your absorption, that could be considered, but if your blood levels are at 50, then no, you're you're getting as much as you would need. So, yeah. Uh, Betsy, behind after a four month UC flare up, thinking diet isn't enough. Yeah, Betsy, so back to the iron discussion. I was talking before about iron, iron status, iron absorption. And yeah, things like inflammatory bowel disease, like ulcerative colitis, that can totally change that, that iron math that I was talking about, that milligram out versus that milligram in. It works on both sides of the equation. You can lose more, but you can also absorb less. And it's, again, Betsy, when, you, when I ran the math on how that equation works out for a menstruating woman, I don't know if you're menstruating or not, but someone who's losing 30 milligrams at least once a month, even, even without that, it's just a break even thing. I mean, what you get is just what you need. There's just not a lot of extra room. So it's very easy for someone to get anemic. Yeah, menstruating women, also endurance athletes of all ages and genders, very easy to get anemic, especially runners, it seems. So like your feet pounding on the ground, that, that, that breaks some red blood cells down right there, but you can fall behind. And at the same time, if someone is anemic, we always want to uh, concern ourselves and know that there's not some other more insidious source behind it. But yeah, Betsy, so Betsy, in terms of forms of iron, the one that I've recommended and used in my store is the iron, it's a version called iron chelate. It's a bisglycinate. That's a type of iron that's got a nice balance between being well absorbed, but not being an intestinal irritant. There are other versions of iron that are taken in higher doses, but the side effect rate is so significant, and especially having UC. And Betsy, from what I was just reading today, I'm gonna to be talking to the doctors about considering alternate daily dosing. So if you're not already on iron and you're going to start on some and you've had digestive issues, you might do really well on alternate daily dosing. It's probably no less effective than twice daily dosing. So even the same amount. So let's just do the math. So if in the course of four days, you got two iron pills, right, by alternate daily dosing or twice daily dosing in those same four days, you would get eight pills. Okay. So we're comparing two pills versus eight pills of iron. You're getting more pills on twice day dosing. And I'm not saying you're taking like all these pills every other day. You're not, you're not taking four pills every other day. You're taking one pill every other day. And it seems like that'll work just as well. Now, short term, like the first three weeks, there may be a head start by taking it twice a day. But once you're six weeks out, it's all caught up. And the rate of stomach irritation is way lower on every other day, as one could expect. So, so yeah, that could be a useful thing to take into account for you. Okay, following up on these. So more on oxalates. Um, yeah, Marco, do almonds or vitamin C have bioavailable oxalates? Da -da 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 -da. Enough for most of us. Boosting immunity, validity, megadosing vitamin C in reports of kidney stones. Yeah, Marco, please take a peek at my paper on oxalates. Uh, it's just a non-issue. It really is just a non-issue. Uh, megadosing vitamin C in kidney stones, that's separate from oxalates. So vitamin C is not an oxalate, it doesn't contain oxalates, 
there are cases of people who are prone to kidney stones that can be more susceptible to them from super high doses of vitamin C. That's generally well above many thousands of milligrams, however, so not a concern that way. But yeah, oxalates. The thing about oxalates is that oxalic acid is the compound that's in discussion, and it's something our bodies already make. And 80 to 90% of what we have in our bloodstream is what we make ourselves. So we do also pee some of the leftovers out, which is normal, and we get some from our diet. Foods have it too. Oxalate is the base compound from which we form ribonucleic acid. It's a really critical part about biochemistry, and plants use it too. So all living things have oxalates that float around that we use that. And we, yeah, we pass it out what we get in from our diets. Some people do make oxalic acid kidney stones. Some are prone to it genetically. Some have it happen if they're dehydrated or for other reasons, but they've done a lot of studies as to whether or not dietary oxalates changes your risk of kidney stones, or if it even changes your urinary oxalate output. It does not. There are people who have hyperoxaluria. Some people genetically, they've got a glitch by which their bodies manufacture massive amounts of oxalates, and they do have health problems. Uh, however, they're no worse off regardless of their dietary oxalate intake. Even those people, when they consume more or less oxalate, it doesn't change their situation. So yeah, people have looked at the bad things that happen to those who have hyperoxaluria, and they've then speculated, which is not implausible, but they've speculated, hey, maybe these kind of bad things would happen to other people by eating oxalates. And it just doesn't happen. <laughs> it's been looked at so thoroughly. So yeah, check those out. Okay, a lot of comments here. Let me catch up with a little bit on Instagram. Let me get one or two more. Betsy, thanks and hello again up from near Bemidji, Minnesota. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't know that. That's way cool. Yeah, Betsy, um, I was hoping to get up that way. Uh, you must have seen me mention that that's my hometown, but it's uh, tough to travel right now. I'd love to go back up and see my folks. We were wanting to go up before now, um, but I'm not sure how soon I'll be able to get back up. So hope you're doing well. I've heard there's not been much in terms of uh, COVID in that area. So that's, that's positive, but yeah, iron, definitely look at bisglycinate. It's our iron chelate. Think about every other day for easier dosing. You know, one more thing, Betsy. So dietary sources are just, yeah, they're really hard to close that gap. Um, I don't know if you became interested in this work because of thyroid disease, but one other point I'd love to mention about iron is just that people with thyroid disease, 30, 40% have autoimmune atrophic gastritis. And what that means is they're just not going to absorb much iron through their intestinal tract. They can take it just right till they're blue in the face, lots of it every other day, you know, however, it's not going to get in. They really need to have the infusions. And the versions of the infusions that are in use now, by and large, there's some that, are, that, that were studied that have gone by the wayside mostly, but the versions that we use, they're, they're safe. They're insanely safe. And I'm running a, the sheet that I'm putting up in this blog. It'll show you like how many days it takes to build up iron if you're this low in it. It'll give you like concrete answers. But for many people, oral iron or supplemental iron, the number of days, it can be a thousand, it can be many hundreds, it's, it's a lot. And that's in the best of circumstances. Whereas if someone's really low, intravenous doses, they can be built up in a matter of minutes. And they're, they're, that whole deficit of one, 2,000 milligrams is just gone. So yeah. Oh, Betsy, after seeing a JJ Virgin's training. Oh, that's cool. Okay, not sure which one it would have been. I actually decided JJ uh, Sunday. We were Zooming on an event together and we're just talking today. So yeah, way cool. All right, let me get another comment here from Instagram. Um, I'm gonna pull back a little bit. I saw one that was pretty detailed. Let's see. Um, here's one about the resets. Juicy abs, cool name. I've done two resets, hitting a wall to get serum leptin down. I work out eight super, can't seem to get it further. You know, juicy abs, serum leptin, I certainly wouldn't change what you do because of serum leptin. We've tried forever to find a leverageable marker of body weight. Now, I don't mean a marker. I mean a leverageable marker. So there's a lot of things that seem to go along with body weight and at the extremes might be relevant. There have been about a dozen people globally, I could be off on that number a little bit, but under 100 people globally that have been found to have defects in which they over-secrete leptin and they end up getting resistant to it. And 
yeah, their appetites are out of control. And they found that if they can overcome this resistance that they have and help their leptin receptors work again, suddenly it's good again. And when that first was, was found, the thought was, wow, this is the answer. We can just help people improve their leptin metabolism and weight can be solved. But it just didn't pan out. So leptin is relevant in some cases, but apart from that, no, it's, it's not, if you change it, you wouldn't change you. And they studied that. They looked at giving people leptin or blocking the leptin receptors or manipulating leptin in some way. And apart from those few cases where it's genetically extreme, manipulating leptin has no effects whatsoever upon your weight or your appetite or your cravings or metabolism. So it can move up and down based on what you do, but manipulating it directly, no. And so it's not a goal. You know, if, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if your health is good, if you have concerns about your health, that's the goal. But leptin's not a goal. It's just a marker that comes and goes on, on its own by and large. So not something I would just change what you're doing because of. Okay, here is the detailed one that I saw. I'll keep tabs, I'll keep my eyes open. This may be my, my last one that I get here for today. Um, Corsiglia, Stefana, I'm probably close, but not quite. Should I be concerned if I have I'm getting my glass so I can read this properly. Sorry. Should I be concerned if I have thyroglobulin antibodies less than 10 and reverse T3 that ranges from 13, 18, 17, or a few months? I'm trying to figure out if I'm hypo due to my symptoms. Hey, wow. So that's an awesome question. And frankly, the data you gave me, I cannot answer that question because it's just not enough data. If you are still on and you're listening and you want to put in some more details, I'm happy to do my best and help clarify that further for you. Okay, so I see your thumbs up. Yeah, please, please give me more details if you can. But so hypothyroidism is not defined based upon the reverse T3 or the thyroid antibodies. Ah, Dr. Seth, welcome. Good to see you. <laughs> Someone else knows you here too, it looks like. Uh, so yeah, hypothyroidism is not defined based upon the antibodies or based upon the levels of reverse T3. Now, to be precise, there's strictly defined hypothyroidism, and then there's having too little thyroid hormone, you know, enough to cause symptoms. We could call this suboptimal. We could call this early Hashimoto's. So hypothyroidism is defined by an elevated TSH and a low level of T4, often with symptoms, but the symptoms aren't relevant to the diagnosis. So to be really precise, Formal diagnosis of hypothyroidism is just two lab values, you know, high TSH, low T4. There's actually a paper that I just was reading moments ago. There's now talk about redefining the TSH upper range to be even higher. There's talk about pushing it up to six or seven. So the criteria for hypothyroidism may become even more stringent. Now, that's not to say that your thyroid can't cause symptoms short of that. There's a lot of data showing how your thyroid levels can certainly cause symptoms or cause fatigue. Um, and it seems that the earliest indicator of that is a TSH getting above somewhere around two uh, different studies, 1.9, 2, 2.5. So different studies look at quality of life of symptoms for people. And when it gets above that range, we see a greater percent of those that start having certain symptoms. And it's especially relevant for those who are on thyroid replacement therapy. They're even more sensitive to subtle changes within that normal range. But no, without defining TSH and T4, you wouldn't say you were hypothyroid. And again, that's not me saying your thyroid is not affecting your symptoms. It still could, but you wouldn't have hypothyroidism per se. Reverse T3, it's something that, um, it's how your body gets rid of extra amounts of T3 normally T4 is broken down into reverse T3. It's the main byproduct. Your brain actually needs reverse T3, believe it or not. Your brain cells depend upon having enough reverse T3. It's not a bad thing. It's not horrible or toxic by any means. It doesn't block T3. It's the normal byproduct. So yeah, but if you are still on and you want to put more details on, I will look for that. Okay, I see. Last TSH was 2.1. So you're yeah, you're right on a threshold in which some cases that can be relevant. My T3 is on the low end. So I'm not sure if I'm having conversion issues. TSH is perfect, 2.1. Yeah, so T3 is funny. And if you guys want to dig deep, um, take a peek at, I've written, just Google Alan Christensen and T3. I've written papers about, many have said you want your T3 to be high normal. Well, 
Okay. <laughs> so what happens when it is? I understand the idea and I started the logic behind why someone would think that, but is that true? Do people who have high T3 levels, high free T3, are they healthier? You know, do they have, are they leaner? Are they more energized? Do they have better longevity? No, actually no in all those ways. Your, your body fat needs TSH to break down. And if T3 gets too high, it pushes down TSH. And now your body fat is resistant to lipolysis. It won't break down anymore. People that are higher in T3 have also generally higher visceral fat when they're high normal and on free T3. So I don't really, I get the idea of wanting to base things off of T3, but the evidence just doesn't line up with that. That's not really what we see in healthier people. So yeah, your TSH is 2.1. You're on the cusp of what's normal or ideal. Past that point, we think about if there is any sign of a disease process in your thyroid. If your gland is enlarged, if it's vascular, if you've got nodules or goiters, if there's calcifications, but those are the main things. And you know, not everyone has symptoms of thyroid disease. Some certainly do, but many people have symptoms for completely other reasons. And that, that could be you. If you didn't have signs of there being structural disease of your gland, um, that may not be relevant. So yeah. Okay. Structural symptoms of your thyroid gland, such as hoarseness, difficulty swallowing, and <laughs> I'm getting close to that. I was, I mentioned to Betsy about hanging out with JJ. So we had a, an event with a group of us health experts all weekend. It was my first time doing a, uh, what a retreat would have been, but here in my house on Zoom, <laughs> and it was Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and a bunch of Sunday. So it was a great thing. We got to really connect, be together, but I talked a lot. <laughs> Let's see, Jolanta. Yes, for the first time, I had a problem to think straight. I don't understand the context. I'm just scrolling back to see if you said something earlier that gives me context. I don't see it. Okay. Hey, Tuva. Good to see you too. So yeah, nice to see everyone. And I'm going to dig through some of the questions that I got uh, about fatigue and make sure that I've got data on that. I'll talk more about those next week. Oh, I saw a follow-up comment from someone I've already spoken to. Uh, yeah, so I'm probably perimenopausal. So Stefana Corsiglia uh, could well be. So menopause, no periods for a calendar year. Uh, perimenopause, some fluctuation in periods, but they haven't quit. And a woman who's past mid to upper 30s. So could well be that can be a source of symptoms. Many things can, you know. It's, it's good to have personal guidance on these things. I think that too many people chase a lot of possibilities and get big long lists of pills they're taking and try all kinds of diets, you know, and really it's not a, it's just a matter of seeing what your needs are and what's off with your system and addressing that really well. And if you all, we, we've got a great team of doctors, they can connect with people via telemedicine, wherever they can help you sort these sorts of things out and see what are the biggest culprits for you and help you address those. But that's the thing you want to be specific. So, all right, take good care. And I'll see you guys uh, next Monday, same time, same place. Be there, be square, if not sooner. Bye-bye. <laughs>